let's get started. This is exciting. Thank you so much, Patty and Dan, for being available and uh, joining us for this conversation. Um, I know Michelle and I have done uh, our best to talk um, at opportunities about um, the trip we made to meet everyone and the formation of this uh, group, the Parrots Conservation Alliance. Um, but I think it's really wonderful to hear from some of the key people who were involved in putting it together uh, to help uh, share some insights um, and provide a little bit of context to um, how it came about, um, what's been happening and what the plans are for the future. But let's start with some introductions because I'm sure that most of the Mikaboo community haven't had the opportunity to meet uh, you, Patty and Dan. So um, maybe Patty, would you like to start and just take a couple minutes to introduce yourself and explain your background a little? Well, um, I've been in the animal welfare field for a long time. And uh, I, I was a vice president of HSUS a long time ago um, in charge of youth education. And we started Kind News. Um, some people that are older may remember seeing it when they were in school. And then uh, another position I had was at PetSmart Charities, which is separate from the PetSmart Inc. Um, and I was in charge of get grant distribution as much as I think it was 10 million a year at the time. Um, PetSmart Inc. has since changed hands and I haven't kept track of what they're doing, but at the time, I achieved one of my goals, at least partially, of eliminate, I, I was hoping to talk the ink side into eliminating all parrot sales. We talked them into eliminating the big par parrot sales. So they were still selling the, the parakeets, um, uh, cockatiels, uh, canaries, things like that. But they did stop selling the um, big ones and the uh, so that was one of my main motivations. Um, change sometimes happens best from within. Uh, I also was executive director of the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries for about five and a half years. And um, that's where I really got my passion for the work of rescues and sanctuaries. In fact, it was a visit to a parrot sanctuary and an equine sanctuary that originally uh, convinced me of the importance of sanctuaries. Uh, seeing some animals that I had helped place um, and knowing what they had looked like before and what they looked like after. A lot of the animals, what they've gone through were due special uh, compensation, I think, for what they had been through, and, and sanctuaries and rescues provide that. And then um, that's about it, I think, highlights anyway. Wonderful. Thank you, Fanny. Thanks for joining. Dan, let's turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Levin. I'm the Vice President of Threatened Species at American Bird Conservancy. I've been with American Bird Conservancy since 2008. And uh, it's a great organization that is focused on the conservation of wild birds and their habitat throughout the Americas. And that includes a lot of species of parrots. And so we've had the fantastic opportunity to partner with many local organizations throughout Latin America to do habitat protection for wild parrot species, as well as nest box programs to help boost their reproduction in the wild, because often Parrots are limited by uh, the availability of nesting sites, particularly if the old trees been cut in, in areas where they live, as well as a little bit of uh, anti-trafficking and anti-persecution work. Uh, because as, as you and our group and this audience probably knows, there's a lot of illegal trafficking of these birds. And in some places, birds are, um, the parrots are raiding cornfields and treated as pests and killed in, in fields that way too. So we've done a little bit of work uh, to try to reduce that as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Okay, fantastic. So uh, maybe we should start at the beginning. You know, what discussion today is all about the Parrots Conservation Alliance, what it is and how it came to be. Um, and Patty, I think I've heard a little uh, of the background talking to you about how this idea was um, sewn in your mind one day, but maybe you want to kick us off with just a little bit of context about how the creation of this group uh, came to be. 
Well, uh, I had seen the power of sanctuary alliances around the world, various ones, but there was not one for parrots. And I began a conversation with Mike Parr, who is president of American Conservancy. And his commitment to parrots is very real. He's a co-author of Parrots, a Guide to Wild Parrots of the World, or to Parrots of the World. Uh, so uh, we're incredibly blessed to have that kind of uh, involvement and leadership. And we, I knew that to be sustainable for the long term, we needed a permanent home. And ideally, it would be um, prestigious and respected and powerful enough to grab attention. And that certainly fits American Bird Conservancy. Uh, also, um, Dan's commitment is very real. You can drop him almost anywhere, well, anywhere that parrots are found in uh, South America, and he can immediately lead a tour, which is really saying something. And he's also a great uh, parrot artist, um, so talented. So uh, their commitment to parrots is very real, which was important um, to have that kind of leadership uh, overseeing this. Um, we, I should say that we started with the uh, Global Federation of Sanctuary Sanctuaries that were parrot focused because that was independent outside verification of quality care. So that seemed like a logical place to start. And of course, Mikabu was one of the first that that group of sanctuaries recommended as being part of this group. We wanted to keep it relatively small so that we could um, build cohesiveness and trust. In that way, we're, um, we're about 30 organizations, but even given that, we are the largest wildlife-only sanctuary alliance in the world. And uh, yes, <laughs> there's Warren in South, uh, or in Asia, there's Ears in Europe, there's Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, and of course, uh, in Africa, and of course, we have um, the North American Primate Sanctuary in um, Alliance here, and Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance. But as far as wildlife only, uh, we are the largest already. So it, it certainly showed there's a need out there, and I know we could very quickly grow I think we're going to follow a little in the footsteps of Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, which was formed uh, 20 years ago. Um, the first few years, they just kept it small. And it wasn't until four or five years later that they really started talking about how to add new members, what the leadership structure would be. They first built up that cohesiveness, that trust among members. And so that's where we are. Uh, right now. Uh, we're also following in their footsteps in that Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, PASA, uh, has a strong emphasis on conservation in the wild and helping those efforts. And that has been a key part of this alliance as well, is for sanctuaries and rescues to step up to the plate and be advocates for parrots in the wild. And um, Maybe Dan would talk a little more about that. Oh, yeah. Got to unmute. Okay. American Bird Conservancy works uh, throughout the Americas and within the United States, mainly through partnerships and a variety of different kinds of partnerships and alliances. And so we're always trying to get more people and groups interested in bird conservation and engaged with bird conservation. And so the Parrot Conservation Alliance seemed like a very good fit to get people and groups that were already very passionate about these birds and connect them with our partners and projects on the ground, as well as those of other uh, conservation groups on the ground in the wild to help make a difference for those wild populations of parrots. Absolutely. And, and, and I think it um, straight out the gate had that impact. I, I remember one of my biggest takeaways from the two days that we spent uh, the inaugural session. Um, you know, if, when you work in the rescue space, I find that, you know, we're so heads down just trying to deal with the rescue situations that are coming at us, uh, you know, constantly. 
um, that to sort of step back for a moment and think about the relevance and how we need to connect with conservation efforts um, and even, you know, just understanding what is happening. You know, there are some places where we can, um, we can make gains, we have made gains, but there's more to do and we're not even talking about it on our side, which is a massive gap. So um, that was probably my biggest takeaway from the whole uh, weekend was just realizing that there's this incredible connection um, that we're not always so focused on because we're, we're on the front lines firefighting, but um, we care about these birds and they, you know, there's more, more to this uh, landscape than just the rescue situation. So it was really helpful. Uh, and what that was another reason that uh, American Bird Conservancy was such a good fit for this is they have a lot of experience in overseeing alliances and working with on the ground people. One of their strongest alliances um, is the Alliance for Zero um, Extinction. Did I say that right? Yeah. That, Correct. Um, yeah, Alliance for Zero Extinction. That um, Mike Parr was very instrumental in starting the president of ABC, and they've been a very powerful and effective alliance. So we're in very good hands. Yeah, it's fantastic. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, that initial two-day session um, once the in sort of initial cohort of membership was identified. Um, Patty said about bringing us all together. Uh, with the help of a facilitator. And um, we all met last October um, in Nashville. Um, we had a two day event um, followed by a sanctuary tour the next day. Um, and that was the, for many of us, the first time that a lot of us had actually met in person or, or met at all face to face um, to be able to connect and start understanding that we're not alone in our efforts. Um, and we have a lot of people who can share their experiences and, and help us band together. So um, Patty, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what the goals of that were, what happened over those two days, and um, did, did it achieve what you were hoping? Uh, it, it more than exceeded my, my expectations. And, and of course, one big goal was to connect us. Um, there were people there who had never met anyone else in the room before. Um, sanctuaries and rescues often work um, in isolation. The sanctuaries are often in rural communities um, because they're noisy. <laughs> um, so there's a sense of isolation which can um, contribute to compassion fatigue, burnout. Um, so it's very important for people to, to be able to finally meet each other, talk face to face, and build up um, a trusting relationship and the spreading of best practices happens in that kind of environment. So my number one goal was just for everyone to network and really get to know each other. So we had a lot of emphasis more than you usually find at a big conference on the breakout sessions. We did have some whole group sessions. Um, we had one on fundraising um, led by um, Carol Baskin of Big Cat Rescue, who is one of the most uh, spectacular fundraisers in the, the sanctuary world, um, going from selling furniture in her house to keep the sanctuary afloat to being able to afford what is in essence a pension plan, really, for each animal. If anything ever happened to the sanctuary, there's money set aside to make sure that animal has uh, a uh, a pocket full of cash <laughs> to go to a, a, new, a new sanctuary. Um, we had the uh, several uh, sanctuary leaders present about the most important things that they have learned over the years. And so that was uh, very informative. Um, we talked about um, of course, the, the, the need for uh, advocacy. Uh, a lot of what we do is focusing on uh, helping to alleviate the problem of parrot overpopulation, homeless parrots, finding foster homes for them, finding permanent homes for them, um, because they are non-releasable wildlife. Um, but we also focused on the need to address the problem 
to turn off that never ending supply of parrots being bred, um, regardless of the, the consequences down the road um, for those parrots. One thing that really impressed me about Mikabu from the start when we were looking at groups to include was you could not Google Mikabu without coming across the slogan, adopt, don't shop. And when you think about it, that is part of conservation because if there were no parrot sales, <laughs> there would be no poaching. Uh, so we can set an example of giving homes to those that are already captive rather than um, this never ending supply of parrots that quickly turn into unwanted parrots, which is why our rescues and sanctuaries are very full. Um, we did the we we also talked about campaigns on behalf of parrots, and we had much, uh, a presentation, a great presentation by um, Dr. Levin Dan on parrot conservation in the Americas. We had some presentations from uh, one from Belize and one from Guatemala to. Um, hear about their hands-on work on the ground. And then most of the rest of the time, I believe, we talked about databases, but I think most of the rest of the time was really uh, talking about um, uh, the breakout groups. And we also talked about the, the need to support parrots in the, uh, their native ranges, reaching out to birders, um, uh, attending birding events as a tabler uh, so that you can make birders aware that we are caring for captive non-releasable wildlife and help garner some more support for parrots in the wild. And then the, the breakout sessions covered a wide variety of topics and Mikabu, I think, led one of those in every breakout session for which we are very grateful. And um, later we can talk about the follow-up work that Mikabu has played a huge role in as well. Yeah, it was a really, really good uh, agenda. Um, there were some breaks, but it really felt like we were, we were going at <laughs> a pace to try and get through so many topics. It was almost, I mean, I, I, the, we also got um, a, an enormous collection of resources uh, to take away with us on a, on a USB drive, which was an even more overwhelming. I mean, I'm still going through and sharing some of that material with some of our um, key Mikabu contacts because um, it was an incredible package that was put together through everyone's collaboration sharing the materials that not just what they presented on the day, but other resources, especially from the Avian Welfare Coalition and other groups that um, are happy to share um, material they've been using. Um, fantastic. Dan, were there any, um, any highlights from your perspective being there? I mean, your presentation was a huge eye opener for me. Um, what, what was your takeaway from it? Well, it was definitely a bit of a whirlwind and, and I had not spent as much time uh, in the animal welfare space or in, in uh, coordination with rescues and sanctuaries. So it was this additional group of people who are very passionate about birds, but are engaging in that space in a very different way. So I found it fascinating and interesting. And, and, um, and there were a lot of parallels, of course, with um, there were there were several people who in the Alliance who were at the conference who were more involved with policy changes at different levels. And I think there were a lot of parallels with what those members were doing, what some of the ABC work is ongoing. Um, so it was a great experience and I was happy to be part of it. Well, it was wonderful having you there and, and really key to making sure that we, we kick off, start off on the right foot. Um, and uh, I also hadn't realized, and you know, we've, we've since that session, we've had several meetings online where many of the members have been able to participate. Um, and I, I really, I suppose, because we haven't had a lot of contact, as you were saying, Patty, sometimes a lot of these groups have been quite isolated just you know, through our geographic situation. But also I think there's been some uh, 
it's been challenging in the past, you know, if, if a sanctuary has had to deal with a disease outbreak or some other very challenging situation, then um, they don't always want to talk about it. But um, at the same time, if we can share information about, you know, how to handle those situations and what, um, what best practices are um, to maintain a healthy population in our, in our groups, then that, that's incredibly valuable. So we're sort of breaking down some of the old barriers in a lot of ways. Um, I think one thing that was um, most eye-opening to a lot of the participants was the, were the presentations on conservation. Uh, a lot of people that own conures don't realize that they're extremely endangered. And um, if they knew, <laughs> they would want to support efforts to save those. Um, sun conures or sun parakeets as they're called in their native ranges. So I think some of those kind of presentations were really uh, eye-opening for the participants as well. Yes, I think the one time that my jaw dropped to the floor um, was, uh, was that Danica's presentation about the sun parakeets um, and how they, they did Danica. a... Danica, thank you. Um, and they, they did a transect study in uh, Guyana, and they only counted 157, um, which uh, left me speechless because, you know, when you think about how many we see in captivity here and then how many they were able to find through, I think, two separate trips uh, to go and try and count the birds in the wild. Um, yeah, that, that, that was the one uh, statistic I shared at our last holiday Mikabu gathering. I talked very briefly about our participation at um, the event in Nashville, and that was the one number that I shared. And there were gasps around the room. People don't know. So hopefully by um, having a stronger connection between our communities and uh, conservation work, we're able to um, help people understand what's happening, what we do know, um, and what we can all do about it, because those links can be a lot stronger. Um, so maybe maybe we want to talk a little bit about what's happened since that inaugural session then because we've had some um, quite powerful uh, moments where we've been able to already rally around um, a couple of causes um, and share some really valuable information with the help of our connections um, meeting together. I think the first one was almost as soon as we all got back home, Patty, you sent <laughs> yes. a call to arms. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we, we didn't know how very um, thankful we would be to have this coalition. Um, there was a petition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department for the importation from South Africa for 4,000 gray parrots. If I get any of this wrong, Dan, correct me. <laughs> but, this all um, sounds correct so far, yeah. <laughs> And of course, we were appalled and opposed. And um, uh, more than 20 of us, I think, sent individual letters or signed on um, and uh, with comments in strong opposition. And also, actually, we were one of the first groups to be reaching out uh, Parrot Conservation Alliance and knocking on the doors of groups like Humane Study International and IFA and saying, you guys have got to step up for this. And they did. Um, most uh, national, international groups were as, as appalled as we are. And it was so heartening to see because so often as people working on parrot issues, we sort of fall in the gaps between the wildlife department and the companion animal department, and it ends up nobody, including funders, um, spending much attention or time on parrots, but boy, they really came through when we needed them. And um, that was really uh, wonderful to see, and it was wonderful to see this group respond to that. So another issue that came up, right, or has come up recently is, the USDA under the Animal Welfare Act was told about 20 years ago uh, to write regs to cover birds. And American Anti-Vivisection Society and Avian Welfare Coalition kept at it for decades. 
and recently won a case that said, indeed, the USDA has to write those regs, and they've got to report back to the court every two weeks, I believe it is now, uh, to make sure that it actually gets done, and now they're soliciting comments. So we're being united in our approach about those comments. Uh, we want to make sure the maximum number of birds can be covered, that should be covered, and uh, an example when it becomes important that relates to the rescue world is when a roadside zoo type situation that was licensed nonetheless by the USDA collapses. The USDA, because they license them, has some obligation to help place those animals. But they had no obligation if parrots were part of that. And I haven't found many situations where parrots weren't part of it. And so no one was there to place those parrots. It wasn't anybody's responsibility. Lots of times the USDA didn't even include them on the inventory of animals at the place that was being closed. So that's just one example that impacts rescues where uh, having the regs is important. And of course, we hope they're going to be covered in the, the pet stores, the kinds of conditions they're kept in there. So there's lots of pertinence to the rescue and sanctuary world, why they should care, and also, of course, to conservation efforts. So we've been united in that. Also recently, Australia has um, been petitioned the government to and their 25-year ban on the importation of parrots, which would be a disaster for parrots. And it could have further repercussions if it passed. It might embolden the U.S. to do the same thing for breeders in the U.S. to petition the U.S. to end our 28-year-old ban on importation of parrots. And of course, any ban on importation being lifted is a disaster for species that are already incredibly under siege. It's, it's just mind-blowing that it's even being considered, but we have to take it seriously because it is being seriously considered. Um, so once again, our groups are writing letters, uh, doing sign-ons, and encouraging national and international groups to do so as well. Um, and we thank Mikabu for hosting those sessions. Um, we've also um, Mikbu has taken the lead on some of our joint rescue efforts to place birds like from a, a closed facility. Uh, how many birds did they have? You remember, Michelle? Uh, close to 100 birds. And those are just yeah. hook bills. That's not counting the owls and hawks and other wildlife, uh, native right. wildlife. So we worked together um, and Mikabu really took the lead on that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, I've really got to survey everybody to see how many birds we've coordinated on placing because a lot of it has just happened rescue to rescue or sanctuary to sanctuary. Um, we also had one on um, disease. Um, Mikabu hosted that as well with Dr. Driggers, the disease is, I'm terrible at initials. Um, <laughs> Pardon? Avian coronavirus, ABV. And um, some of the participants said it was the most valuable session they attended in years. So um, really vital information to get out and to share and lots of robust discussion around that issue. Um, so those are some of the ways that some of the outcomes we've seen. And, and Dan, maybe you could um, talk about the work with One Earth that came about through this. Sure. Um, going back to the presentations we were talking about, Sun Parakeet, um, I connected with One Earth Conservation and we funded uh, the continuation of some of these surveys to not just survey the Guyana side, but also the Brazil side of the population to get a full estimate of the entire global population of the sun parakeet in the wild. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that work in the field has been postponed into 2021. So that'll still happen eventually, but um, it, 
it didn't happen as planned. Uh, the pandemic unfortunately put a monkey wrench into a lot of plans for a lot of people this year. But despite that, there's actually been a lot of good news on the parrot front in the wild that I'd like to share um, because I think people need some good news about parrots too with all the bad news in, in, in our world. Um, for, for starters, we've been working with a, a group in Ecuador called Hokotoko Foundation on the Lilacine Amazon, which is a recent uh, taxonomic split. It used to be part of a, a other populations as one species, and now it's recognized as its own species endemic to Western Ecuador. And there's very few of them left in the wild, and we've been working with them for a couple of years and a local community at Las Balsas to protect some of the most important roosting sites of these birds. And they've also been, as part of this work, monitoring where they're roosting, where they're nesting, where they're breeding. They found a, they found a whole bunch of nests. And recently they had a record high count of more than 2,500 birds coming into these roosts. And that was more than they thought existed in the entire global population last year. So uh, there's some good things happening there and we're really proud to support Hokotoko Foundation on that front. And additional land protection is ongoing with, the, with that community. Then. In Brazil, we've been working with this group called Aquasis in the Baturité Mountains in northeastern Brazil on the gray-breasted parakeet, which is one of these conure species, uh, Pirura is the genus. And we've been working with them uh, for a long time on outreach and education and nest box, artificial nest box programs to boost the, the reproduction of the species. And um, again, the most recent count in December 2019 hit a record high of 657 birds counted, that doesn't, that's probably less than the whole population, but just counted, that was a record. And then in uh, 2020, when the nesting season finished, they had 388 birds fledged from the nest boxes. So that's additional new birds out in the wild. And total since 2010, they fledged more than 1,500 chicks from, from these nest boxes. So that is very, very successful and we're thrilled uh, to be partnered with Aquasis on that project. And then other good news on nest boxes, going to Bolivia, um, our partner, Asociacion Armonia, fledged 12 blue-throated macaws from their nest boxes at the Laney Rickman Reserve this year. And so, again, this is um, a population that's only a few hundred birds in the wild. And uh, throughout the whole history of their nest box program, they've fledged 93 birds in the southern population and they have another 100 plus birds that congregate at a different reserve in the northern population. And so between these two places, they, they're protecting a significant portion of this species wild population. So there's, there's been a lot of good news on the parrot front with these wild birds. Um, at the same time, we're seeing a lot more attention being paid to wildlife trade and um, which relates to the, the lifting of bans and trade bans. So when um, the United States passed our ban on importing the vast majority of parrot species in the early 90s, it had the desired effect of greatly reducing the amount of trade in these wild birds related to our market. And then within 10 years, the European Union did something similar, and we saw a similar decrease in, in wildlife trade going to those markets. Not 100 percent, but but a significant decrease. And now what I've recently learned uh, from attending some talks on parrots related to trade at the North American Ornithological Congress is that other markets in South America and Asia have taken up that slack essentially. And, and now the amount of parrots that are being traded is similar to before these bans went into place. It's just shifted to other places. So mm -hmm. we thought maybe some of us uh, incorrectly thought that um, a lot of that problem had been solved, and unfortunately, it's come back in a slightly different form. And so American Bird Conservancy is also looking very hard at how to engage more in wildlife trade of parrots as well as songbirds. Um, and you may see more action uh, from us in Mexico, for example, with parrots, as well as in Bolivia, where we've worked with, again, Armonia on red front of macaw trafficking and persecution, and, and I'd like to see us do more on those fronts. And I think there's a lot of opportunity now to do more on the, on the wildlife trade front um, at def lots of different scales of this issue. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, you can feel free to contact me 
um, as well, because there's a lot more that needs to be done on that. Each group that participated in the conference was given a uh, hundred dollars, not a lot, but uh, to start their donating to conservation efforts. And quite a few of them um, I know donated to the Blue Throated Macaw uh, Project, Dan, because um, they were very moved by that and heartened by the successes that they were seeing. And I know those uh, many of the groups are continuing to solicit funds for conservation projects and, and taking some on as a special cause of theirs. One thing I know from my years of working with foundations, and I forgot to mention that in my background other than PetSmart Charities, but I've been an, a member of Animal Grant Makers almost since its inception. And when, when we when we broaden the amount of issues that we're covering, as long as they're still pretty core, um, then it, it just attracts new donors, new money. It doesn't take away from what you're already giving. In other words, if someone is supporting your rescue efforts and then you say, by the way, these birds are in trouble in the wild, they don't say, oh, well, forget helping you in the US, we're just gonna help those in the wild. No, they do both. Um, our, our hearts don't have on and off buttons. And so when we hear about needs, um, we respond. And so I think it's really crucial that uh, sanctuaries and rescues um, continue to remember the birds that are in such desperate need in the wild. Right, you have to be able to cover all of them. And um, to that point, uh, we can share some links Dan, to the projects you were talking about um, so that when we, we publish this, people can follow through to get more information on some of those initiatives you were talking about. I think that's one of the best ways we can um, help make it accessible to people because um, getting the word out there so that people know where they can go and learn more about. It's nice to have good news, the, the areas where you, there is progress being made. Uh, you know, you were talking about compassion fatigue, Patty, and how, you know, we burnout is a real struggle um, uh, a lot of the parts where we're active, but um, so uplifting to come away knowing that there are, there are ways that we can do something that's really positive um, and get these birds back out where they belong. So it's the, it's the positive side of the story. We, we can just help be the megaphone to make it more accessible to people. Exactly. Great. Um, there have been some other um, positive takeaways and follow-ups from uh, for the group since we, we first met and now we've been more connected as a network online. We've had some conversations around um, collaborating on potential transportation initiatives when there are birds we might need to move. In fact, actually, before we'd even all finished our inaugural meeting, Patty was already leveraging the group to try and rehome a sanctuary that was having to close. Um, which I think w was was successful as well in helping find uh, homes for um, yeah. some birds that we're going we're going to be challenging to place under the circumstances and um, it was being really well organized in anticipation of the closing. Um, so we've ha we've had quite a few uh, situations that we've already been collaborating on. Yeah, yeah, that that was a a, a sanctuary where the founder. Um, was dying and has since died of cancer. So it was a very urgent need. And um, as you said, they were mostly very difficult, challenging birds to place because that's why they were in a sanctuary. Yeah, that's the, that's the reality of most of the birds being placed in sanctuary. That's where they need to be. Yeah, so it's been, uh, it's been I, su I suppose it's almost a, a year now coming up. Um, since we, we got together. So what, what happens next, Patty and Dan? What are, your, um, what are your hopes for the next 12 months? Well, it, it would have been um, different had COVID not <laughs> raised yes. its head. Yeah. So everything's kind of put on hold in terms of thinking to, about getting together even regionally or another national conference. Um, there's uh, 
there, I think everyone would have an appetite to get together again in person with the same core group. Um, last time we also visited, uh, toured a sanctuary that had just made the transition from the birds in cages to birds in flight aviaries. And, um, and so we'll want to be at a site where we could visit another sanctuary or rescue. Um, uh, and um, because I think people found that part very inspiring as well. Uh, we will continue to offer uh, presentations via Zoom, which Mikabu is being um, gracious enough to host for us, and we really appreciate that. And I hope we have some um, more conservation uh, presentations. Um, Dan, we didn't talk about the, the one you participated in um, that we all uh, were invited to. You want to talk a little about that? Sure. Um... Paul Rilo at the uh, Tropical Institute of Tropical Biology down in Florida organized a panel of parrot conservationists um, to talk about uh, parrot conservation issues, um, particularly in the new pandemic world with uh, trade and zoonotic disease outbreaks. And then I think we, it was so popular that we had a follow-up uh, webinar about that and he had a great panel. Uh, one, of, one of the members of the panel, uh, Juan Carlos Cantu, is from Defenders of Wildlife Mexico. And even since then, uh, ABC and he and his organization have been in contact about how to help him and his activities on Red Crown Amazon trafficking and education outreach around that in Mexico. And, and ABC has been independently in parallel doing more work on Red Crown Parrot in, in Mexico as well. So that's been very successful. And uh, likewise, I, I think we've been in a, a startup getting organized stage and we've done an incredible amount even in that stage in that short period of time. And I'd like to see more connections between the sanctuaries and the rescues and these on the ground uh, actions and, mm -hmm. and projects. Um, we've got a lot of opportunity, again, to work more generally on trade uh, specifically, I think on Red Front of Macaw in Bolivia, we've got an interesting tree planting project for these birds behind me, the Lear's Macaw in Brazil, where we're trying to um, plant some of their Lasuri palms, which is their main food source, uh, because long term, we think that there's um, an issue there. We've protected a lot of their nesting sites and their populations are growing, but we want to restore some of their habitat. So I think there's lots of opportunities uh, to do parrot conservation in the wild and I think this could be a great group um, to help connect to that and mobilize and help those projects go forward. And if not even the, the groups themselves that are part of this alliance, their supporters and, and, and their networks um, to draw from. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really important connection that we're able to start making thanks to having this alliance. Wonderful. Well, any final thoughts from any of you all? We have, we have your ears for another five minutes. <laughs> I, I think what is really crucial is that this is sustainable. It has a permanent home with American um, Bird Conservancy, ABC, and that makes all the difference in the world uh, to have that uh, permanent home. Uh, I've worked with sanctuary alliances around the world, and that is really a key factor is to either have permanent hired staff or to have a permanent home uh, because you need that for sustainability going forward. I think we will also um, focus some um, additional efforts on uh, building our own sustainability as organizations. And um, certainly we did quite a bit on fundraising at the conference, but there's always room for more of that and what impact COVID has had and talking about avian flu um, and uh, what, what that might mean for us and parrots. And uh, because it's probably a matter of when another outbreak happens, there was one in South Carolina this year uh, of a very deadly form of the avian flu. So there's lots of issues um, for us to explore and work on together and just 
best practices, sharing best practices. One just quick story that was interesting is um, Jungle Friends, which primarily houses primates, little monkeys, um, not the big primates, um, also has parrots. And they um, incorporated their tunnel process where an oasis has done the same where there are um, a, a bridge between facilities of a wire tunnel and you can get the birds in it with treats and then put a pitchfork like thing in there so they can't back up and keep moving them down it. And that's actually how uh, Jungle Friends loads them into carriers when they need to take them to the vet because that can be challenging when they're out in the aviary. So right. it's interesting to see some best practices from the primate world infiltrating the avian world. <laughs> And uh, they face some of the same challenges of, of um, breeders breeding them as pets when they're not uh, uh, appropriate for most people to have as pets. Very challenging wildlife to have in your home. And in many ways, parrots are, are monkeys that fly. So uh, the, the same intelligence level, the same curiosity, all that. And also, uh, we have the added challenge of so many species um, and each species is, is pretty unique. So with their needs and their care needs. So there's just an unlimited number of topics that we have to explore and work on. And, and gradually after we're a real cohesive group with a high level of trust, we can start bringing in others into the group as well. Right, yeah. If, uh, I can't talk very much, but I did want to emphasize what a critical difference it is, I think, to our success that we are visibly part of a worldwide network, basically, at this point, that we're not a small group of people fighting against this flood of animal abuse, uh, that there is a coherent universe of people out there that are doing the same thing and that we're linked um, for a rescue. Uh, the absence of isolation is an enormous improvement. Absolutely. Yeah. World changing. And we, well we've stated. <laughs> we've already had conversations too about how we can formalize our support for conservation. Um, it wasn't something that was uh, formally part of our mission statement and um, we're looking at what other rescues and sanctuaries have been doing in terms of partnerships and what um, we think could be successful so one of our board members um, is leading an initiative for us to um, propose some ideas and help us make that something that's more um, concretely captured and, and shared so that we can have a program in that space right. because it's, yeah it's, it's not something that we fantastic yeah yeah. On, on a, a kind of a different but related note, um, I've been thinking a lot that we're all quite isolated at home. I've been telecommuting and, and everyone doing this physical distancing in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, so thank you, Mika Boo, for putting together this webinar, because I think this is one tool that a lot of people can use to connect to a, a community that cares about birds and learn something and also take action that helps connect them to positivity and, and good things happening in the world. And then also, you know, at ABC, we've seen a lot of growing interest, almost an explosion in just backyard bird watching. Um, nature is more than ever a balm on uh, some struggles that people are going through. And so even just getting outside in your own backyard or just around your block and seeing what birds are passing through uh, or visiting your feeder can really be helpful on kind of a personal level and and uh, I think we're seeing a lot more interest in that. And hopefully that'll translate into more people interested in birds and advocating for them. Absolutely. Yeah, I have seen that too. Uh, and I am also doing it for my own, my own back windows. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Well, thank and you. I think, I think it's important for everybody who's watching as an individual caretaker of parrots to know they are part of the solution too, because these are, um, non-releasable captive wildlife that are deserving of the best life we can give them in captivity. 
I've got the door shut to my Quaker Airlines so that nobody zoomed in during this meeting to zoom into our Zoom. Um, <laughs> but each of us that, that is caring for a non-releasable parrot and, and that um, took in a parrot in need um, and all the parrots that come to Mikabu uh, fall in that category. You are part of the solution. And like I said, I mean, it's stating the obvious. If there were no parrot sales, there would be no reason to poach parrots. And America is part of setting the example for the world of um, saying no to taking parrots from the wild, saying no to breeding for a life in captivity, because ideally where parrots belong is in the wild, um, but parrots in captivity, even if all breeding ceased tomorrow, is going to be with us for 80, 90, 100 years, <laughs> given how long these birds live. And it's certainly um, everyone who's caring for one deserves a huge thank you. Very true, very true. Thank you, Patty. And we failed to mention in your introduction that uh, whilst you have a, a vast amount of experience um, working with uh, sanctuaries and foundations, you, you also have your own birds. So you're carrying, you're part of that, that group too. What do you have? Um, well, I, you can see I've got a crest. That's from having a goffin now. So <laughs> it came with a, uh, a blind Quaker in need. So that's how I ended up with a goffin. I've, uh, my own parents have, have been Quakers. There, I was working at the Arizona Humane Society, did not, have any parrots as pets, but there was one that was brought in that was a plucker, a screamer, a swearer, a biter, and for some reason nobody would adopt him. So he came home with me, and uh, Dr. Driggers, who presented to our group, was my avian vet, and he was doing home visits, and every time that damn vet visited me, he pushed me <laughs> to make a bigger improvement so that I ended up with an indoor, outdoor aviary with a mate for him, no reproduction. Um, so they're flying, they they got inside portion, outside portion. Um, he always came up with yet another way to make their life more enriching. And um, there's always something we can do to make their lives better. I also had at one time about a hundred birds because of a cruelty um, seizure. Um, and we had most of those, some we were able to place right away, but most of those we had for five years until we got a grant to open up room at a sanctuary that had the other half of a lovebird flock and the other half of a Quaker flock. And when they were reunited after five years, they so recognized each other. It was, oh it was really something to see. Yeah, they don't forget. They don't forget. Mm -mm. Goodness, that's a fascinating story. It's making Michelle's Michelle's uh, rescue bird population sound small, which is saying something. Because in the Nick <laughs> <Uber. laughs> you always think of Michelle as having the most uh, birds in care at home. My goodness. Well, thank you all so much for your time and uh, helping us get to know the Parrots Conservation Alliance a little better. Um, it's been great to be a part of it in this first year and we're looking forward to seeing what we can achieve in the coming 12 months and beyond. So thank you again for your time. And yeah, we'll, thank you. um, we'll put some links to accompany this, uh, to some of the, the follow-up information about this group, some of the members and some of the initiatives that the American Bird Conservancy have been uh, working on and, and talking about. Wonderful, thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you so much.